you can buy all the books, take all the classes, buy all the DVDs, and in five years your work will be indistinguishable from anyone else. He said, best thing to do is quit doing competitions and just start doing what you want to do. Find a bird, live, dead, whatever, and just carve what you see. Carve what you have a passion about. Hello, and welcome to the Boy Rock Art and History Museum's YouTube page. So normally, we would be hosting our Cockman Curator Program with you in person, and it wouldn't be filmed. But, you know, dire circumstances cause for improvisation. So today, instead of Cockman with the Curator, we're having a morning with the Master. And we're joined by Pete Lupo himself, and he is going to take us through his exhibit, Shared Spaces, Wildlife and Sculptures. Pete, you there? Thank you, Lou. Thank you so much. Um, thank you guys for viewing my exhibition of Shared Spaces, and welcome. The name of this piece is Trying It On For Size, and it's a, a pair of Carolina wrens who are making a nest in an abandoned old boot. And I like this piece because of the interaction between the two birds, the male and the female, and people, especially couples, tend to relate to that. And they seem a little relaxed, and in this order, I'm able to put the birds in almost a triangular position, and it keeps your eye centered on the piece, and it brings you around back to the center. Everything is carved from wood except the leaves. The leaves are made out of grass and the grasses as well. But the boot is carved from wood. The boot, the boot took about a month and a half just to do the boot. Uh, just through the rough carving, the hollowing out, and doing the fine stitching and the wrinkles. So do you actually stitch the wood or is, is that all carved too? It's all carved into the wood. Wow. And then why do you choose to use metal for certain pieces? I used to do wood and would steam the wood in the little curves as you see the curves on the leaves, but even steamed and coated with super glue, they're so brittle, they would still break. So the first time you tell something, someone is made out of wood, they will touch it and it will snap. So just for integrity, it's, it's a little easier to do it out of brass. Everything is tupelo wood. It grows in the swamps from uh, Virginia all the way to the uh, coast of Texas, but I buy all my wood from a gentleman in Louisiana. He air dries it for six to eight years before he'll sell you a piece, and I can get it in big blocks enough to do the boot and decoys and things like that. It's very lightweight, very porous, holds detail very well. I like to use acrylic. Uh, I started with oils, but just starting out 37 years ago, I was too impatient. And instead of giving it all time to dry, I would touch it. So then I found acrylics. And because there's so much detail on the pieces, I just put very thin layers of acrylic, almost like a wash, about the consist consistency of tea. And I just keep layering the colors over that. And is there a part on this piece that shows the natural wood color? No, just the bottom. called the Garden Gloves, and it's one of my favorite pieces. This is my grandmother, that, uh, as I mentioned, they were farmers down in Robson County, and she would pick cotton, pick tobacco, just like the men would, but then she could come in at dinner and make biscuits, and then at night, she would sew lace for her daughter's dresses and stuff with fine, I mean, with thread, almost like spider silk. So the difference between what she could do and then like that, that really inspired me. So she was big on gardening, so I found an old pair of gloves, plus I text, you know, roughed them up a little bit with some rocks and things like that, put a little more age on them. But this is in homage to her, with the way she would grow flowers and things like that. So the flower petals are made out of metal. The stamen part, the center part of the flowers are all made out of wood, and they're all compressed together. It's like there's two rows of flower petals, and the stamen and the bottom of the flower are all glued together to make one flower. So when I first did this, I probably had 35, 40 flowers, and then when I went to arrange it, I didn't have half as many. So I went back and made another two weeks of making flowers, just to get this point. And the butterflies are called uh, meadow fritillaries, 
So I chose them because they were just small enough to fit that. And again, I have the accent where it comes back around to uh, a circle that brings your eye back to the center. Uh, when I did the basket, the basket took about a month and a half to do. Uh, when I first carved the basket uh, and everything was smooth, I drew all the lines onto the wood. But then I, I lost the, the depth of it. I couldn't tell what was up or what was down. So I sanded all the lines off and I did one line all the way around the center. I cut that out and textured it. That told me what each line next to it was going to be. The gloves are made out of wood. Uh, they're textured just like the butterflies, just like the birds are. Uh, once you do the general shape, then you come in with little stoning tools, dental tools, and burning them and burn the little texture into it. And if you look at butterflies, wings, or the gloves, anything like that, under a microscope, you just see little patterns and little swirls. Uh, on a particular on a butterfly's wing, you see little diamonds. And, and I mean little scales, but if you burn it in very, really tight lines and come back at 90 degrees and burn it the opposite direction, you end up with these little diamond shapes. And that gives a depth to the butterflies as well. And since it's out now, if you look at it, then you can touch the inside of the glove. You'll feel it almost like felt, like on a pair of gloves. This piece, we were having a get together at our house. We have a, we live on a little ridge here outside of, a, of Little Rock in the Caldwell Mountains. And my wife had all these flowers and we were had the back deck set up with tables and tents and everything. And she had some verbena, which had broken off. She had a little little pot full of verbena. She had one little stalk that broke off. And I had a beer bottle set there. And so we thought, just put that verbena in it. So we put that in it and made it a centerpiece on one of the tables. And we went back inside to finish getting the, the um, stuff ready. You know, when we came back out, there was a great spangled fritillary on that flower. And I told her, get some photographs. So she took maybe eight or 10 photographs. And I kept that for about four or five years before I finally, and just a combination of the flowers. Now, of course, she had a verbena, and I like that. This is the Indian black flower. And so we thought putting all that together, that just happened all at one time. That was once in a blue moon. The flowers are actually carved, uh, the flowers on the baskets you saw earlier are made out of uh, metal. The flower here is everything is carved out of wood. Uh, the flower petals are all separate, uh, done separately and added. And each Indian blanket has anywhere from 13 to 17 pet uh, petals. So once you make the stamen on top here and the bottom or the leaves around, then you just keep adding petals and you have a box full of petals and you add them you know, so there are different shapes, so you keep adding and find an empty space until you get anywhere between 13 and 15. The label and the, and the bottle and everything else is, is painted. Uh, it's not put, uh, peeled off or anything like that. And I just really like the moonscape and the landscape with the snow and reminding me of the mountains. Uh, similar to the cans where you take the little metal planer blade and, and compress the fibers and just shave the wood down to get it slick. Uh, this one, this particular piece, I don't know if it's going to match you up, I did leave the bottom blank so oh, you can okay. see that it was made out of wood. Wow, hold on, let me zoom in on that. Wow. And one thing I did learn on the way to, to doing this, because again I take my calibers and measure the bottle and I think that not all bottles are round. This particular one I made from the bottom was a little almost egg shaped. But this one I decided I made brand. This piece is called the watering hole. And this is about my grandparents' home. And as kids, when we weren't working in the fields or weren't outside, if you wanted to get a drink of water or something, you didn't go in the house. You couldn't go in the house to get a drink of water. So there was an old ladle or an old cup or something always outside on the outside spigot. So Instead of grandmother working about, or worried about uh, how much dirt you get in the house, she would let you drink from an old, rusty, dirty cup. But it, 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 was, it was fun growing up at that time, I, and I'm glad I did. I remember how life was then and little things like that. 
which I think helps me with my work right now. And this is a Carolina chickadee on an old spick and everything. And everything's carved out of wood except the, the little piece of wire. That's actually made from wire. The, the handle comes off, uh, the, the spigot comes out of wood, and the cup is made out of wood, and it also comes off, as you can see. And there was a funny thing after you start looking for these old cups to use as models, is that if you start paying attention to it, you'll notice that there's more chips on one side than the other. That tells you if the user was a left-handed person or a right-handed person, because when they would clean it, they would tap it like that. This is called the fuel hat. Uh, again, it's got the two birds making a nest working together. And they, they're, my grandfather had two hats. One he wore every day, and then one he wore on Sunday at church. After he got back from church, it went back in the box, back on the shelf. Then he put this one back on. So the old hats, they always picked it up by the crown there and put it on. So this is always first first, uh, first part that wore out. And then when they call setting it, they always put it down. They put it on and set it by pulling that rim down there. So you can see it's a little lower, a little dirtier. And I put little sweat stains in it like that. From just That's why you wore outside. But this is textured the same way the blue, the same way the birds are. It's got little uh, textures from those fibers from taking that little dill bit and just causing it to bite into the wood. And after you texture this part, then you seal that part before the fibers have time to collapse. So this has been touched so many times it's almost smooth. But that was a very hard piece of wood. I wouldn't use it for a bird, so it was ideal for my hat. Uh, so that just for the hat itself, it was about a month and a half. And hat is actually hollow. You can put it on your head, except for a little part back here where it's attached to the, to the wood. So uh, I had our old hat we bought at a flea market God, probably 20 years ago. And I didn't like the band on it, so I cut the band off it, not knowing the band's what holds the hat together. So there was a guy in the door that ran a kite shop, Blue Moon Kites. And he collected old fedoras. So this was modeled off an 1898 fedora from Germany. So again, like the can, it was in pristine condition, so all I could do was take measurements and photographs of it. Everything here, and it, it's this, it goes back to growing up at that time and paying attention to the moments, and again, being a Zen type thing, is that be aware of the moments. And that's what brings people back to the moment, is once they find out it's made out of something, they saw the moment and it reminded them of something. But then when they realize it's made out of wood, they come back to the moment. And the more you pay attention to the moment, the deeper you can go into that moment. And it'll take you, take you somewhere else. 2,000 year old Japanese form of fire engine called Ikebana. Mm -hmm. It has to do with the heaven, man, and earth, and it creates a circle pattern. But basically, if you hear the golden, the third, you know, mm -hmm. something that way. Uh, but I like that. Uh, and you see, I used to do the, the competitions with the songbirds and decoys and things like that. And someone would have a very nice bird on a walnut map you know, with a branch out. Well, when the branch extends past the bird, the viewer's eye follows that branch and they tend to walk away from the piece. Mm -hmm. you know? They, unconsciously, they don't know it's leading them in a different direction. And this is called uh, Fragile World. And this is, unfortunately, this is what happens to our world, is that everything man takes from the earth goes back to the earth. So as this can, man's, man's work disintegrates, goes back to nature. Nature grows up through it. Nature, if you give it its lead, will come through and overtake our, our mistakes. So that's why the goldfinch is on top of it. So that, the emptiness there, I needed something inside. That's what brought the chipmunk in, which has brought the hickory nuts and things like that. So the, if you look at it, and this is again too much detail. If you look at it very closely on the hickory nuts, you'll see the incisor teeth. These incisor marks where it's chewed through the hickory nuts. Everything, everything is about moments. Everything takes you deeper into it. So, that told me what needed to go in there, so I put the chip in there. So you look through there and you see that sleepy little eye. Diana, or whoever positioned this light, it comes through that hole right here and shines on the yeah. yeah. If you come on this side and look through that little hole, you'll see his big eyes open looking back at you because he knows you're bigger than you. Oh my gosh.
It's about moments and being drawn deeper in the moments. And they're everywhere. I mean, they're, this is a moment. And the more you get into the moment, the more you're aware of things, it'll just take you, take you deeper and deeper into a story. It reveals more layers and more layers. And I read an article, uh, the interview that Granger McCoy did. He said, you know, you can buy all the books, take all the classes, buy all the DVDs, and in five years, your work will be indistinguishable from anyone else. He said, the best thing to do is quit doing competitions and just start doing what you want to do. Find a bird, live, dead, whatever, and just carve what you see. Carve what you have a passion about. So that brought the stories, and that, that took me into a deeper level of, of trying to understand that. And again, because it takes so time consuming and so depth that you actually find yourself getting into it, drawn into it. And the hour just passes. You don't, when you back away from it, you realize, how did that happen? You know, it's, it's eerie at times, but it's very cool. Well, your work process is a form of like meditation in that yeah. sense. And your intention behind each piece is for it to also be a meditation for the viewer to sit there and draw in and be part of that moment. So but it, it's, and the people now that they've, that they've heard it sort of, well, I like this kind of piece, I like that kind of piece, but I want the story too. I don't know what the story is. I can't do the story and then make the piece fit it. So like, like that, all that, that wasn't planned on being in there. It was just coming in old can and woods. And I just like the color of the combination. But then that, the emptiness is what brought that in there. And then somehow the, the holes just lined up right. A couple of them are intentional, but the rest of them just happenstance.